Thanks so much indeed. Thanks for the kind invitation to this exciting first workshop on quantum tensor networks in machine learning. And maybe unsurprisingly, this is precisely what this talk will be about when we have a look at tensor networks as a data structure in probabilistic modeling and for learning dynamical laws from data. Indeed, the time seems very much ripe for such a workshop. Even in these awkward times, I sincerely hope you're all well. Given the many connections that are emerging between studies of tensor networks, notions of machine learning and quantum physics. Tensor networks capture data with some kind of locality structure well. They have numerous applications and come along with powerful numerical tools. They have been invented and reinvented at least three times that I'm aware of and have originated most prominently in the condensed matter physics context, but also in other fields. Now there's more than a superficial resemblance with neural networks in machine learning, specifically with deep convolutional neural networks. And while neural networks are not quite tensor networks, the connection is way more than some kind of superficial analogy. It has become clear, for example, how one can precisely think of notions of supervised learning with quantum inspired tensor networks, then of generative modeling using matrix product states, a specifically important class of tensor network states. And tensor networks can be used also as a tool when studying the expressive power of deep learning methods. Quantum mechanics comes in as the tensor networks methods we have in mind commonly originate from the quantum context. But there's also the cute ingredient that quantum circuits may have something to contribute to machine learning in the first place in notions of quantum assisted learning with the hope of generating speed ups over purely classical algorithms with quantum algorithms or have, a, have better generalization bounds in some way. This is basically the, the coordinate system of the field. And at the heart of this talk are basically two core questions sitting in this coordinate system. The first one is of a somewhat pedantic but not unimportant nature. So we are excitedly talking about tensor networks in machine learning, and this is great, but, but how far can this go? What is the expressivity of tensor networks after all? In other words, what can we learn from, tensor, from quantum tensor networks about probabilistic modeling? The second one is more practically minded, although it also has a pedantic component and asks how one can learn dynamical laws, non-linear dynamical laws from data alone or discover dynamical laws in the first place when observing nature. And we will see that tensor networks are again the tool to have here. And if time allows, <laughs> that was a joke, it's a recorded talk, so I know time allows. I will say a few words more on the quantum side of things when we hint at PSC quantum distribution learning, single shot gradient estimation, and the variational learning of quantum metrology protocols. This is our plan. We are all set. And we will start with looking at the expressivity of tensor networks in probabilistic modeling. The starting point of our journey are graphical probabilistic models. So structures that embody probability distributions in a clever way. Here a graph expresses the conditional dependence between random variables. Used in many readings of machine learning, specifically in generative modeling and unsupervised learning. This, this here is a simple example of such an undirected graphical model, even though in practice it rather looks like this, but never mind. Um, the point is that such an undirected graphical model defines a factorization of the joint probability. And the maximum cliques in that graph correspond to one term each. It is a way of organizing probabilities with specific dependencies. So graphical models can be converted to factor graphs defined on a bipartite graph of factors and variable vertices. One factor node is created for each maximum clique and the factor is connected to the variables of the corresponding clique. And then if one reshapes and massages things, one finds that what comes out at the end of the day is nothing but a 
tensor network. In fact, here a so-called matrix product state. What is a tensor network? Well, I hardly have to explain so much here what a tensor network is. It's a network of tensors here represented as boxes with legs sticking out. If it's an open index, it would be a, a free leg sticking out. And otherwise, if they are connected edges, one would sum over the joint index, one would contract the respective index in the tensor network, as one says. What is the big deal? Well, the point is that these structures are ubiquitous in our description of nature. There are very powerful methods known for them, good numerical techniques, in their quantum setting, they are very deeply understood, also mathematically, in that, say, the, our understanding of the phases of matter goes via symmetry properties of certain tensor networks, and there are workhorses in several readings of condensed matter physics. Maybe slightly less so in the context of probabilistic modeling, but the connection between probabilistic modeling and tensor networks is increasingly receiving attention and that is the very point why we are having this exciting work pack, uh, workshop in the first place. So this here is a linear tensor network, a matrix product state, MPS, or also many paper state, for good reasons. Now we can also add hidden layers and look at notions of hidden Markov models that again give rise to tensor networks. In fact, one of the inventions of tensor trains was via so-called finitely correlated states that um, in a Heisenberg C star algebraic picture generalized hidden Markov models to the quantum setting. So hidden Markov models are also tensor network states. Cutely, short quantum circuits, Born machines, also give rise to tensor networks. So if you think of a, of a short quantum circuit upon which we perform a measurement then when we contract this circuit and look at the overlap with the measurement operators, we get give rise to a tensor network that captures the probability distribution obtained upon measurement. So again, probabilistic graphical models, hidden Markov models, short quantum circuits, they all give rise to tensor networks. They represent probability distributions and conversely, Tensor networks can give rise to powerful tools to capture probability distributions in the first place. But, but how precisely? What is the expressive power when we do probabilistic modeling with tensor networks? And there's many ways of writing probability distributions in terms of tensor networks. And then the question is, what is the respective expressive power of these parametrizations with respect to each other. In other words, how useful, what is the expressive power of using tensor networks in the context of probabilistic modeling? No straightforward way of writing a probability distribution in terms of a matrix product state or a tensor train is this one here, where one has like the legs sticking out that represent the actual probability distribution. And there's an extra connection, an extra edge of a certain rank, the TT rank or the tensor train rank that captures like the correlation structure in the problem um, that takes the role of the bond dimension in the problem. Now it takes a moment of thought to see that if the entries of the tensors are all non-negative reals, then we also get out a non-negative real at the end of the day that we can interpret upon normalization as a probability distribution. Now, interestingly, we can also think of doing the same thing, but with the entries being reals, but not necessarily non-negative reals. And we could kind of take the phases in such a way that we could get a probability distribution out nevertheless at the end. We could even go as far as taking a different field, namely having complex valued tensors, but where the phases are so tuned in such a way so that we still get a probability distribution out at the end of the day. This would be a kind of a genuine quantum tensor network, if you want, very much in the spirit of this workshop. So these are kind of three ways of representing probability distributions in terms of tensor trains, but there are also other ways. 
For example, we can think of what is called a Born machine that quantum physicists would know as um, a, well, as a pure quantum state written as a density operator in terms of a, a matrix product state represented pure state and a dual vector just below. The structure is given as this one here. There's still a kind of a rank, the Born rank that governs the correlation structure. And again, it should be clear that if you pick the entries to be non-negative reals, we get a way of writing out a probability distribution. In the same way as before, we could in principle also think of real entries in our tensors and even complex valued tensors, tensor entries that would at the end of the day still give rise to a probability distribution. There's yet more meaningful tensor representations. This would be so-called locally purified states where we have an extra bond connecting the two layers of a certain rank that we call purification rank or puri rank that quantum scientists would know as locally purified quantum states or positive matrix product operators that take an important role in the study of Gibbs thermal states or dissipative quantum systems. And again, the entries can be non-negative reals, reals and complex values. These are all different kinds of representing probability distributions in terms of linear tensor networks. And to be very much precise about that, they are all complete. For a finite system, every probability distribution can be precisely spelled out in that fashion, but I can also approximate in an appropriate fashion um, each probability distribution arbitrarily well for large systems. However, the respective expressive power can be very much different for these representations. If you start out from one representation, there could be um, vast overheads when going to a different representation. So how are these connected, these representations connected in their respective expressive power? And in fact, there are surprises in these separations. Start with the matrix case first where this table here summarizes our findings complemented by other findings in the literature where the left hand side gives the specific ranks of the respective forms and the right hand side is the form one transforms into and if there's a function in this table this function specifies the overhead that's needed going from the left to the right form. Some entries are rather obvious say when going from the TT rank to the Born rank there's an x squared because there is a TT represented state and the dual vector which together gives rise to a quadratic overhead. Other entries are by no means obvious and are quite fierce and it took us weeks of banging our heads against the board to find these entries. Um, when there's a no in the table it means that there is no functional dependence which means there can be an arbitrary separation between the two respective forms. When there's a question mark, it means that we could not find an answer. There are not so many question marks, but there's one related to the hardest matrix problem I've ever encountered so far, it seems. It's a cute problem, feel invited to have a look at it, where the question is when you represent a matrix in terms of a locally purified state in this fashion with a delta tensor so that you get a matrix, the task is to with a tensor with a TT rank and the Born rank on the left, transform it to the right hand form where the Born rank is one and one would like to have a bound to the TT rank that is needed on the right hand side to capture the left. Be much invited to have a look and um, contact me if you have an idea. The key point, however, is that these matrix results can be uplifted to genuine statements as separations for true tensor networks for arbitrary system sizes n, so with n random variables in this linear tensor networks, giving rise to a number of true separations in expressive power between different kinds of writing probability distributions as tensor networks. Time is short, so for that reason, I will only mention two of these separations that are particularly surprising. The first one is that using complex instead of real tensors leads to a reduction in the number of parameters. In fact, to an arbitrary large reduction 
in the number of parameters of the network. And that is really surprising and strange. Why would it help to have complex valued tensor entries to represent a classical real valued probability distribution? But it does and even in an arbitrarily large um, way. So in this sense, it can be, be seen almost as a manifesto for this workshop in that true quantum tensor networks are more powerful in probabilistic modeling than real valued tensor networks. The second one is equally surprising in that locally purified states are provably better than any other representation considered. In fact, again, with an arbitrary large reduction in the number of parameters of the network. And that's again surprising in that why would this extra lag between the layers help when representing a probability distribution in the system size? But it does, and again, in an arbitrarily um, separated uh, fashion. Now, these are rigorous results on the expressive power of using tensor networks in probabilistic modeling, but they're also reflected by very hands on practical consideration when looking at the ability with the help of these factorizations to learn realistic data sets where interestingly the expressive power in this rigorous way we've just um, looked at is matched by their respective numerical performance when using these data sets in practical machine learning tasks. Lesson to be learned in all that is that tensor networks provide powerful tools to capture probability distributions in probabilistic modeling. In fact, in more than one way. At the rigorous assessment of the expressivity of various forms of doing that can lead to big surprises in that there's vast separations in the expressive power of these very representations. This as a rigorous result in probabilistic modeling is a nice step in a good direction, but we need more of that kind. As first good news, the separations found remain stable under errors in that we are not looking for an exact, but for an approximate representation, then these separations will remain. But we need way more insights of a similar kind on the expressivity of finite round quantum approximate optimization algorithms, say, or of structured quantum circuits or of variational quantum eigensolvers in their various readings. So see this as an invitation to think about the expressivity of models using a machinery of tensor networks. Let's me to the second big question of this talk on the learning of dynamical laws with tensor networks. In fact, classical dynamical laws that are commonly given as differential operators on trajectories of some real variables. Now it has been the key endeavor of the natural sciences over centuries to find out what these precise dynamic laws or classical equations of motion are in the first place. Say when Kepler stared into the sky and saw these funny points walking around, it took a lot of data and his genius to find out what the underlying dynamical laws are based on data, which he formulated into the now famous Kepler's uh, laws. While this, I would call obvious in the setting of planetary motion, to find out what the dynamical laws are is much less obvious when we think of systems with many degrees of freedom where the curse of dimensionality sets in where there's no hope of kind of discovering the, the underlying principles or the dynamical laws from first principles in, in any way. And this is a very foundational and fundamental question. In fact, even when I give a course on classical or quantum mechanics, when I mention that the Hamiltonian is given and that describes the dynamics of the system, each time some student asks, yeah, but where does the Hamiltonian come from in the first place? And then I say it's kind of given by the specific system, but they rightfully then complain saying that, well, but how do we know there's no voice speaking to us what this Hamiltonian or this um, Lagrangian, whatever in the system would be in the first place. It has to be kind of constructed from data. So how can we learn dynamical laws from data in the first place, very much in the spirit of this um, workshop? 
means that we someday go into a lab and take snapshots in time, m snapshots in time and estimate the derivatives at these times to kind of estimate the right hand side of the governing equation. So the task is to identify the governing equations of motions from m observations in time. So to come about, we have to pick some kind of dictionary of basis functions to express the entire problem in. So we define some dictionary of such um, basis functions, uh, functions and construct the transformed data matrix for the various snapshots in time. And the problem at hand is then to determine the coefficient matrix of these that kind of govern the um, the kind of linear combinations of these uh, basis functions in the in the dynamical law so that the cost function is minimized, which would just mean that the prediction would match the observed data in two norm in the best possible fashion. And if you want, we can also kind of regularize, as one says, this term by adding a one norm so that um, as a kind of a penalty, as a regularization that would favor in a kind of Occam's razor mindset, sparse, that is to say, simple dynamical laws for the given data. It was just a kind of a, a matching, a, a fitting problem, given data within a, dic a certain dictionary, what is the best way of representing the observed data using that dictionary of basis functions? And um, including this regularization, that this is called Cindy, that finds a sparse coefficient matrix and indeed that recovers small problems well, like the Schuer circuit, kind of chaotic circuit, is very nicely reconstructed from data in this fashion. The problem, of course, is what happens if you think of systems that involve a very large number of degrees of freedom, where, again, the curse of dimensionality sets in, where we can't just pick a very large dictionary of functions, where we need some well-defined hypotheses to start out in the problem in the first place. Natural such hypotheses, well, it takes a moment of thought to realize that if you take a product basis ansatz, any function in the span of a product basis coming from the local function dictionaries can be expressed as, a, as an exponentially large tensor, still subject to the curse of dimensionality, that is now not representing a quantum state, nor a probability distribution, but a collection of functions. The key hypothesis and the key structural assumption is that it makes sense to take the scissors out and cut this tensor into pieces so that it's well described, well approximated by a tensor train, so that the basis dictionaries can be cast into the form of a tensor network that respects locality and a natural correlation structure in the problem in quite the same way as we can expect quantum states that are represented by tensor networks respect locality and a natural correlation structure in the problem. This is for basis elements, but we can go further and think about sets of functions as well. And there's also several ways we can incorporate the data tensor into the, the problem. One way is to make sure that each tensor core inherits an additional index encoding the corresponding equation so that the additional indices are contracted with a delta tensor that selects the appropriate tensor core for each equation component. We can also make use of a selection tensor that selects the core that gives rise to the, um, the single functions, or we can also just append a single extra leg, a data leg, to one of the cores in the problem. It should be clear at this point that each of these representations is efficient but it should also be clear that an understanding of the involved ranks, specifically in the, in the last problem where we add an additional leg to the problem, is key to a good recovery in the problem. Understanding all this, it becomes clear that we can cast the entire problem of learning dynamical laws as a recovery problem quite in the mindset of a compressed sensing problem. For this recovery problem, a number of numerical and rigorous insights can be formulated, which is the technical meat of our work. For example, the pseudo-inverse of the coefficient tensor can be computed in a small polynomial time for m data points, suitably exploiting the left and right normal form of the um, tensor train format, which is nice as it shows that in principle, a single sweep from left to right is good enough for recovery. 
in practice, in either of the mentioned formats, as a deep understanding of the evolved ranks is important to get a stable recovery, rank adaptive schemes are key and we made the best experiences with a new kind of rank adaptive scheme as a regularized alternating least square method referred to as stabilized alternating least square or in short salsa method. And this framework does give rise to an efficient recovery of unknown dynamical laws from data alone. As a short example, we have looked at the Fermi Pasta Ulam Tsingu problem as a problem of non-linearly coupled springs with a dictionary of the first four Legendre polynomials per site uplifted to the full function dictionary making use of the tensor train format and have shown that um, uh, taking data that for suitable data levels we do get either perfect or close to perfect recovery from of the unknown dynamical laws from data alone is that structured tensors, in particular tensor trains, give rise to good results when discovering dynamical laws from data. So when learning unknown equations of motion in a machine learning mindset from data alone. Again, this is rather a beginning than the end of a program. So see this as an invitation. One can think of hierarchical um, projected entangled pair networks for dynamical recovery, obviously, but also from a conceptual understanding, it would be good to identify better recovery guarantees, understand expressivities, also expressed in terms of correlation measures quite in a similar way as we know this in the quantum context. This is the perfect moment to come to an end and stay in time and turn to the summary and outlook. At its heart, this talk was concerned with two fresh readings of using tensor networks in the context of learning. In the second part, we've used tensor networks not in order to parameterize quantum states or probability distributions, but in fact functions from function dictionaries and have found that this can be used to learn dynamical laws from data. And this is not only a connoisseur's question, so we hope. We advocate here a scalable way of discovering dynamical laws in a machine learning mindset in situations where it is simply infeasible to identify such dynamical laws via reasoning or from first principles. In the first part, we have looked at the key question of how powerful tensor networks are conceptually for probabilistic modeling as they arise from probabilistic graphical models or short quantum circuits. So frankly asking, Yes, if you want to do learning with tensor networks, which seems a great idea, how well can this work? And what do tensor networks after all represent? This ends the main theme of this talk, but I would like to mention that this is only one aspect in a bigger picture in our coordinate system that we have had a look at at the beginning of this talk. Say, if you think of a variational quantum circuit, it's great to know what the expressive power is, but it is a different and equally important question to see how one can classically control such a quantum circuit in a meaningful fashion. So here we have found that it's not good advice to aim at estimating expectation values to estimate gradients, but in fact, single shot measurements should be done where one just performs a few measurements of the same kind to arrive at unbiased estimators for gradients with still proven recovery and convergence guarantees. Then one can use variation quantum circuits in order to learn schemes that give rise to good performance in quantum methodological tasks. This is interesting as one uses one quantum device, here a near term quantum circuit, to design another quantum device, a quantum methodological setting. And finally, one question that's keeping us very busy these days is regardless of any hype, the conceptual question of what advantages in learning tasks one can expect. We've already made progress by showing an exponential speed up in probably approximately correct distribution learning of quantum over classical computers, which is motivating us much to look more at the noisy setting to find out how powerful quantum machines are. This ends the circle through our coordinate system. I come to the end. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the questions you might possibly have.